Many scientists look at the SETI program and they say, see, we've scanned the heavens and we see no evidence of any intelligent life in outer space. Well, I don't think so. I don't think that perhaps in the next century we'll find any usable signal from outer space. First of all, we've only scanned perhaps a hundred light years from the planet Earth in some detail. Our galaxy is a hundred thousand light years across and galaxies are tens of millions of light years distant. So we've only scanned a small neighborhood of our galaxy. Second of all, we've only looked at frequencies near the frequency of hydrogen. That's silly. This goes back to the person who, who lost his key. A person who drops his key will often look next to a lamppost. But if you say to the man, why are you looking next to a lamppost? You dropped your key over there. The person will say, well, that's where the light is. There's no light over there. Therefore, I will look over here. We look at hydrogen frequencies because they are convenient. However, we don't think, scientists don't think that these aliens will communicate at hydrogen frequencies. Perhaps they use laser technology. We've only barely begun to scan other frequencies. Therefore, we have to look at the broadband. Also, when you communicate across vast distances, we sometimes take a signal and chop it up. And then we send each piece and it reforms at the other end. That's how the internet works. Email is chopped up, sent through various cities, and is reformed at the other end. But if you were to intercept one fragment of email, you'd get nonsense, gibberish, until it's reformed. Therefore, in outer space, they probably send signals not on one frequency, but perhaps on the entire spectrum, so that a passing star will not interrupt the entire signal. Then at the other end, they reassemble the signal. If you were to listen in on their signal, you would hear gibberish, nonsense. In other words, we could be in the middle of an intergalactic conversation and we wouldn't even know. Our technology is so primitive, we look on simply one frequency. Any advanced civilization will send messages across all frequencies in order to compensate for passing stars, passing stellar explosion and static and interference. That's real science. However, scientists sometimes judge alien technology on the basis of what we can do, not on the basis of what a type three civilization, millions of years more advanced than ours, can do. There is the famous Fermi paradox. That is, if there are extraterrestrial beings out there, then where are they? Well, take a look at this. Let's say we have an anthill in the middle of a forest. And right next to the anthill, uh, they're building a 10-lane superhighway. And the question is, would the ants be able to communicate or understand what a 10-lane superhighway is? Would the ants be able to understand the technology, the intentions of beings building a 10-lane superhighway right next to the ants? Let's say, however, you go down to the ants and you say to the ants, I bring you trinkets, I bring you beads, I bring you knowledge, I bring you nuclear energy, I bring you DNA technology, I bring you utopia. Take me to your leader. Is that what you say when you bump into ants? No. Most people simply step on a few of them. Now, if we are really a type zero civilization and beings of a type three civilization can soar across hyperspace, they are perhaps millions of years more advanced than us. The distance between us and ants would be the same comparable distance between type three and a type zero civilization. In other words, we are so arrogant, we're so conceited that we say they must visit us. We're so important that they're going to interrupt all their business just to come to us and give us a little bit of super technology. I don't think so. Again, ants looking at a 10-lane superhighway, they would first of all not even know what a highway is. They would not be able to detect the presence of the highway, understand their communications. And even if they did, would the ants say, why don't they visit us? Why don't they come and bring us this fantastic technology of ours? I don't think so. 
Other than the question of perception, scientists point to physics-related problems to disprove the theory that we are being visited by extraterrestrials. Their main argument, of course, is the expansive distances that separate the stars, which seem at first glance uncrossable, even traveling close to the speed of light. In physics, we have something called the giggle factor. That is, anyone talking about UFOs will find themselves drummed out of the scientific community. UFO research is the third rail of science. Any scientist who dares touch UFO research finds their scientific career electrocuted. However, I think we have to look at the long-term perspective. Many scientists say the stars are so far away, hundreds, thousands of light years away, that any intelligent being would take thousands of years to reach the Earth, making it impractical. I think that's a mistake because we assume that these extraterrestrial beings are only 100, 200 years more advanced than us. Then that's a problem. Einstein said that the speed of light is the ultimate speed limit. You cannot go faster than the speed of light. That's Einstein's special theory of relativity. But you see, we have to go beyond Einstein. We have to go to the general theory of relativity where it is possible, we think, that you might be able to go faster than the speed of light. And even beyond that, to the quantum theory, to the unified field theory, in which all bets are off. So I think that the fundamental mistake that many scientists make is that they assume that extraterrestrial beings are only 100, 200 years beyond our civilization, not thousands, millions of years beyond ours. What if extraterrestrials do not come from another planet, but rather from another dimension that we are unaware of? A sort of parallel universe out of our grasp. Five years ago, such a concept would have been considered ludicrous. However, with the discovery of quantum physics, our vision of the universe is changing. When I was a child, I used to go to the Japanese tea garden in San Francisco, and I used to look at the fish, the carp, swimming in a shallow pond. I used to go down and look at the fish and wonder what would it be like to live in two dimensions. These fish could only move forward, backward, left and right. And I imagine what a strange universe it must be. The concept of up, up into the third dimension was alien to them. I could put my nose right next to the fish and they would never know that there was something called hyperspace. Today, many physicists believe that we are the fish. We move forward, backward, left, right, up, down. And we say that's all there is. What you see is what there is. However, we now believe that there is a theory of everything that will allow us to, quote, read the mind of God, as Albert Einstein would fondly say. We think that there is a higher theory called M-theory, that exists in 11 dimension. Dimensions where we have strings and membranes that pulsate. And we now believe that our universe is nothing but a tiny bubble, a bubble floating in a much larger hyperspace. In other words, cosmologists don't really believe in a universe anymore. We believe in a multiverse, a megaverse of bubbles that are constantly springing into existence, expanding like in a Big Bang. So in other words, our universe may coexist in an ocean of other universes. Now, five, ten years ago, this notion was considered bizarre, science fiction, not anymore. In the last five years, the data is almost conclusive. We have something called inflation. The fact that the universe expanded in many stages, won an extremely rapid stage of expansion. The only way to explain this rapid expansion is to assume that our universe is a bubble coexisting with other bubbles in a multiverse, in a megaverse of universes.